Good morning and uh, welcome to this Sunday worship message. Uh, we are looking at the ascension today uh, of, of Christ. And as such, we are looking at the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 44 through 53, <clears throat> where Jesus says the following words. Jesus told them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He also said to them, this is what is written. The Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead the third day, and repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And look, I am sending you what my father promised. As for you, stay in the city until you are empowered from on high. Then he led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he left them and was carried up into heaven. After worshiping him, they returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they were continually in the temple praising God. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's start by a word of prayer as we go into the message today. We thank you, Lord, that your kindness and your goodness has drawn us to you to once again hear your word and to grow in our understanding of your plan, your salvation, the meaning behind the cross and the resurrection, the meaning behind the spirit that you now have sent into our lives, into our hearts and minds, renewing, reviving, leading, and transforming us to fulfill our destiny in you. And this we pray in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. So these are the last words that Jesus spoke in the Gospel of Luke. And this is post-resurrection. Um, there is not a lot of material. There's not a lot, of, not a lot that the Gospels record reg regarding Jesus' ministry for the 40 days after his resurrection. So, But we do know that once the resurrection took place on that Sunday, the first day of the week, there was 40 days in which he appeared to various groups, specifically his disciples, that he taught them and continued to teach them regarding the kingdom of God, a message that he proclaimed and taught and demonstrated from the beginning of his ministry. And as such, when we get to verse 44, he can, is continuing to refer to the kingdom of God. Now, he doesn't refer to it by name, as he had done earlier in the gospel and through his ministry, but he continues along the same theme, if you will, along the same uh, proclamation of the kingdom. And I'd, like, I'd like to take a closer look at what he's told the disciples in these texts. Again, he said, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Now, many times we can think, oh, here's a little indication of what he was uh, referring to, um, you know, a little, maybe a, an Old Testament prop prophetic writing here and there, a few scriptures, a few verses uh, here and there that refer specifically to his death and his resurrection. What he's referring to here, however, is everything written about him, which includes all of Scripture. All of Scripture is written about him within now the context of his resurrection and what God is doing. 
He is opening their minds to understand the totality of Scripture that has now been fulfilled in Him and is being fulfilled in Him through us, through the Spirit that is at work within us. And so, as we read, He opens their minds to understand the Scriptures. In light now of the resurrection, they're looking back and saying, how does this fit in? And so I'd like to take a little bit of time. There's, there's not enough time to get into it in its entirety because as Jesus spent 40 days teaching and explaining, and then beyond that, when he sent his spirit and, and instructed Paul, it took many years for Paul to really put into context the meaning of what just took place through the Christ, through the Messiah suffering, being resurrected, and uh, fulfilling the promises that Israel was expecting him to promise, and the promises that were fulfilled that were given all the way back in Genesis. So I'd like to take a moment and, um, and see if we can at least hit the big ticket items, if you will, Everything written about the Law of Moses, which is the first five books of the Bible, the prophets, and the Psalms, the Psalms which were written by David. Excuse me. If we go back, we see, and this is broad terms, but I think the broad context is, is helpful in this, in this case. In the broadest context, God brings into existence this world. And as such, he gives a very special vocation to humankind that we are to be made in his likeness, in his image. We are, if you will, the image that everything in the physical world can look to, to see an image, if you will, that will point to and direct to the greater reality of the goodness of God, the grace of God, the power of God, the truth of God. We are God's image bearers. Also, Adam and Eve were given all of the land. Go and be fruitful, multiply, spread over the entire world so that my image will be carried to the ends of the world. They were given land. They were given the vocation. They were given, if you will, the covenant that they were to, in Genesis 1.26, rule or have dominion over or to judge or to, if you don't like those words because of the poor job that we've done, be responsible for all of creation. That was their vocation, to be God's image bearers and to care for the world, for one another, to express God's love. That is the covenant of Genesis 1.26. Adam and Eve then fell into idolatry. Once they fell into idolatry, they were removed from the land. Once they were removed from the land, we see that all of the thoughts of human beings became evil all the time. There's no way that God could dwell with them any longer, for they no longer could function in any capacity as God's image bearers, but instead, through the idolatry, brought into the world only evil all the time. God then, through Noah, decided to renew the covenant, start over. In fact, God gave Noah a covenant saying, I will never, ever destroy human beings in this manner before. And now through you, I will give a covenant. You are to have the land, Noah, and your descendants, and you are to be fruitful, and you are to multiply. And through Noah, then, is the covenant. Once that takes place, we see that God speaks because Noah's sons once again fell into idolatry. God speaks specifically to Abraham and says to Abraham, through your descendants, not only will I make a great nation, but every single nation on earth will be blessed through you. And God gives Abraham a covenant. The sign of the covenant is a circumcision. The covenant was that Abraham now was, Abraham's descendants was to get land. They were to be given this land. They were to be God's image bearers in this land. And they were to care for all of creation in this land that God was giving them. 
Once again, Israel fell into idolatry. They were removed from the land. And by the time Jesus shows up on the scene of world history, Israel is waiting for their redemption, for God to say, yes, I removed you from the land because of your idolatry, but I will restore you. I will come back and dwell with you. I will be your God and you will be my people and there will be a covenant. And the original covenant of Genesis 126 will once again be reenacted. So they were waiting. They knew through the Old Testament prophets that this would take place through the Messiah, that the Messiah would usher in this era. They knew from, from the Psalms that it would be an era where the covenant was, a new covenant was put into place. Not like the old covenant, but a new one, a covenant of their hearts as it was in Jeremiah. And that God would restore the covenant that was specifically given to Israel, but also given to Abraham, that all nations would be blessed on earth through his descendants, but also a fulfillment of the promise that God had given in Genesis 3, which is regarding Eve, Adam and Eve's fall, fall into sin or into rebellion, um, which leads to death. I will put enmity between the serpent's descendants and the human being's descendants. And the serpent will try to strike his heel, but he will crush your head. He will destroy the work of the serpent forever. So all of these, these promises, all of this history, all of the hope that one day, it, one day Israel would be restored, given land, fulfilled or, or restored rather to the original covenant of being God's image bearers, to be one with God, to have a covenant where they were to um, usher in all of creation into the worship of the living God, where there would be no more idolatry. And as such, the effects of idolatry would be destroyed. There would be no suffering. There would be no death. There would be no misery. There would be no pain. There would be no violence. There would be no animosity. There'd be no contempt. There'd be no fear. A new order would be created. And Israel was waiting for this hope. They had no idea how God would fulfill it. The only way that they had as an idea of how God would fulfill it was their past. And their past pointed to certain aspects of how God would fulfill this promise, but not the means that he would do it. So when Jesus came, he did not come proclaimed as the Messiah as such, although John did say this is the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. This is the Messiah, although he didn't anoint him in the same manner that Samuel did Saul or Samuel did David, but there still was an anointing. And so all of the scriptures that were pointing to this one time in which God would not only restore Israel to dwell with them and to be their God and to give them land, but also to fulfill the promise that God gave through Abraham that all nations would be blessed through the Messiah, through the descendants of Abraham. And these, all of these promises were fulfilled through Jesus. The manner in which they were filled, no one could have ever predicted that God would bring a Messiah and then as such bring the Messiah to fulfill the destruction of sin by way of the cross, where the political powers of the day, the pagan political powers of the day, the religious powers of the day, who had also fallen into idolatry, the injustices of the day, the pecking order of the day, the, the pain and reality of sin in which neighbor is turned against neighbor, in which accusation and, and violation are run rampant, in which fear and threat and manipulation are common day life realities, that was all absorbed into the cross. And as such, as a display, God put to death sin, the result of idolatry and the nature that prompts us into idolatry. Sin was put to death on the cross. And 
through the resurrection, the demonstration that God's power had overcome the result of sin, the pain of sin, the reality of sin. And so this is what God, this is what Jesus rather was revealing to his disciples. More clearly in verse 46, Jesus says, this is what is written. The Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead the third day. <coughs> Excuse me. And repentance, forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. You read this when you begin to understand the prophetic writings of Daniel, Ezekiel, Jeremiah. You don't see it if you read them outside of the reality of the death and resurrection of the Messiah. But in hindsight, you can see through the death and resurrection of the Messiah what those scriptures were pointing to, referring to, and alluding to for a future destiny, a future fulfillment of God's promise, the means, if you will, of God fulfilling these promises. Which is why when you take a look, for example, in the Gospel of John, you'll see that all that was happening of Jesus coming into Jerusalem on what we would call Palm Sunday, they, they saw what was taking place, but they did not realize what was taking place until after Jesus was glorified. And then they were able to see in light of the death and resurrection of Christ that these things in the past had been written about him for the very now that they experienced. At the time, however, they were unable to see it. It was 2020 hindsight in light of Christ's death and resurrection and the Spirit unveiling the truth of the prophetic writings pointing to that. That's why in our creeds we can say, in accordance with the scriptures, that he died and, and was buried and rose again in accordance with the scriptures. After, of course, he taught all this, he then led them out to the vicinity of Bethany and lifting his, uh, his hands, he blessed them, which is a, a, a priestly endeavor. And while he was blessing them, he left them and was carried up into heaven. So he now, after going into the realm of the dead, coming back, goes into the realm of what we would call the realm of heaven. He begins his reign in that realm, as well as his reign here, although his reign here is a hidden uh, kingdom. Um, Jesus even says that when he's talking to Pontius Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. You cannot see it. That doesn't mean it's not in the world. It's not of the world. It's not, it doesn't function in the same way. You can't perceive my kingdom the same way you can perceive a national kingdom. A national kingdom, the kingdom of a, na of a nation is perceived by its governmental structure, by its military, by its uh, gross domestic product, etc. But my kingdom is not perceived in that way. It's perceived by the reality of God among us. And as such, our future covenant relationship with God. The covenant that we have with him now and the covenant that he will fulfill the last day, the day of the resurrection in which he makes all things new. This is our promise. This is our destiny as Christians. It is a kingdom given to us, prepared for us before the creation of the world. So my friends in Christ, as we look today at the ascension of Jesus, the words that he taught his disciples, the words that he revealed to him are just as true just as real today. And as we practice discipleship and do seek God's kingdom and the truth of his word, he by his spirit continues to open our minds to the truth and the reality of what God has done through Christ, what God is doing through Christ, even this very moment, and what God will ultimately fulfill through Christ in the final resurrection. It is our promise to hold on to. It is our promise and hope that gives us strength, that gives us purpose, that gives us meaning, that gives us a new life. And my friends, my prayer is that that life is something that you experience every single day with every breath that you take. For the love of God is unconquerable. Nothing can separate us from his love. So, 
May his love be with you now. His promises be with you forever. His spirit be within your mind with every thought that you have. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for your grace and for your kindness, for your love, for your spirit that transforms how we think as we focus on your teaching and your word. Your promises that are our greatest strength of joy. The joy of the Lord, your joy is our strength. May we find rest in your truth, joy in your truth, power in your truth, hope in your truth. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a wonderful day in the Lord. Um, my prayer is that you enjoy and experience his rest today as, uh, as we grow in our faith. And uh, we will see you next time. Before, just as a reminder to tomorrow on Monday at noon, we will have a special Memorial Day time of, of music as we honor those who have given their all for us in the armed forces. That will be again, Facebook Live tomorrow, Monday, Memorial Day at noon. Until then, God bless and have a great day. Take care. Bye-bye.